Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a comparison of fatigue delamination propagation in DCB specimens for two different material systems. Um, we're also going to look at the quasi-static failure behavior of the DCB specimens. And this work was carried out by myself and two master's students, Ido Simon and Tome Shukrun. So first we'll talk about the motivation, why we're interested in, in making this study. And then I'll present to you the material systems and the specimens. We'll look at the fracture toughness resistance curves. We carried out constant amplitude fatigue tests for different cyclic R ratios, and we'll look at the results. And then we'll represent it in a different fashion with the Hartman Skyva representation, um, which was originally developed for, for metals. And then we'll draw some conclusions. So, our interest in studying these laminates and the delamination that occur in laminates is because they're so widely used in industry today, the Airbus 350, the rear fuselage is made of laminates, and the Boeing. 787 Dreamliner a fuselage is also made of laminate. So delamination becomes a very important subject. And the problem is that there are stress raises such as a free edge or a notch, a ply drop and so on that cause delaminations to occur. And we can also have local buckling and these delaminations occur and then propagate. So our motivation in particular is to look at aircraft. And we know that today's aircraft are composed of 50% composites. So they've become very, very important for us. And as you can see in this slide, we have a delamination between an upper ply and, and there are a number of upper plies and a lower ply and the delamination propagates along the interface. And this indeed is a problem. Uh, an airplane sees a spectrum of loading and you can divide them into blocks. And so here we have cycling between Pmax and Pmin. And so we can define the cyclic load ratio RP, which is Pmin to Pmax. So we have one and we have another and so on and so forth. And we can have many, many N different cycle ratios. So you'd say to me, well, then we have to do tests at each one of them. And our aim is not to do tests at each one of them, but to do tests at let's say four different cycle ratios, and then be able to have a master curve, which would allow us to obtain the data for N any cycle ratio. So this is our aim and this is our motivation. So the first material system is composed of a carbon fiber fabric, just like your shirt, except that the weave is made of, the, of carbon fiber. And so we're talking about a plain weave, which we just have under and over. And the yarn um, has a width of approximately two millimeters in the particular system that we're talking about. And this is a material which is produced by Hexel. It's called a prepreg. And the fabric, the carbon fiber fabric, is impregnated in resin in the process that Hexel carries out. And at the end, out comes the prepreg, and it comes out looking similar to paper towel. Um, it's dry, the resin is inside it. And so you can fabricate uh, a structure by laying it up in the same direction or different directions, depending on, on the structure. So for this material system and the carbon fiber is G0814, the epoxy is 913. It's composed of 15 plies from this prepreg and it's manufactured in an autoclave where uh, the temperature rises to, to melt the epoxy and it's in a vacuum. And so our layup is alternating layers of the weave where the yawn is in the zero 90 degree direction. And then for the, um, the, the ply be, below it, it's in the plus 45 minus 45 degree directions rotated around the axis that's coming out of, of the slide. And so here you see the layup. 
we have 15 plies, seven plies above, this represents the delamination, and eight plies below, below, alternating between 0, 90, and plus 45, minus 45 degrees. And we have the initial delamination is made by a PTFE film of a thickness of 25.4 microns. Now the second material system is also made of carbon fiber, but this is by a wet layer process. And here we have 19 plies instead of 15. And we have a layup in which, again, we have alternate woven ply 090 plus 45 minus 45. But at the interface, at the interface, and the black line represents the interface, the green is a UD material with fibers in this X1 direction. And all the rest of the plies alternate between plus 45 minus 45 degrees and 0 90 degrees. So our delamination, where now the PTFE insert is 13 microns thick, is between the UD ply and the plus 45, minus 45 degree plies. And as I mentioned and didn't explain perhaps, we have what's called a wet layup. So the technician lays out the first ply, if we start at the bottom, plus 45, minus 45. He paints on with a brush, uh, the epoxy, then he puts another ply on, these are all dry plies, and continues to paint the epoxy, put another ply, and so on and so forth. And so this is a wet layup that's done by hand, and so um, it's, there's, it's less exact than what's done with the pre-preg. A pre-preg, I would say, in some sense, is more reliable. It doesn't depend so much on the technician who is making the layup. So the specimens that we're considering are double cantilever beam specimens. H is the height of the specimen. And for the uh, thinner specimens with 15 plies, the first material system, the prepreg, H is approximately 3.6 millimeters thick. And for the um, material system two, it's five millimeters thick. And then we have the width, the initial crack lane from delamination length measured from the piano hinge. Uh, A is the length measured from the edge and L is the entire length of the specimen. So we followed um, ASTM and ESO standards. They are for UD laminates. So we, we use them as a guide. Of course, things are somewhat different because uh, these specimens are made of Mainly, mainly woven um, plies. So without going into detail of how we carried out the tests, we can compare our results between the pre-preg and the wet layup. And so we can see for the pre-preg, which is thinner than the wet layup, G1C, the initial critical energy release rate is higher. It's 507.5 as opposed to 357.9. Then we have G1SS, they both of them rise up at a different rate. The uh, wet layup rises up um, more slowly than the prepreg, the prepreg rises up to G1SS. And the G, the steady state values, that's the SS, um, are between, are, are very similar, 711 and 220, uh, 728. So, so they're kind of similar. So we would say looking at this, that uh, the prepreg is, um, is to be preferred over the wet layup given the initial, the initial higher properties. But of course, there's a bit of a fly in the ointment there are two different thicknesses, and we have found, and, other, and some others have found, that there's an influence of thickness. If the material is thinner, we get a higher G1C. And we don't see that for G2C and for mixed modes, but I, I'm not going to go into that in this talk. So some of this, um, some of this increase in the G1C value could be related uh, to the thickness of, of these specimens.
Next, we carried out fatigue tests, and I will talk a little bit more about them. And you can see our setup. So we have an Instron 8H72 with a load cell. And the load cell that we're using is 215 newtons. Um, we have two computers, one which is controlling uh, the machine and the other which is storing pictures which are taken by, you can see that there's a camera uh, in, in this uh, slide. And um, we follow the pictures later on after the test is over, um, the student, the students follow the pictures and follow the delamination length versus uh, the applied load and the uh, displacement of the actuator, which are, are written on, on the pictures. So we have full synchronization between load, displacement, and uh, image number. And of course, then the length of the delamination. The tests here were carried out in displacement control. So we define a, dis a cyclic displacement ratio, RD, which is D min to D max. The prepreg, for the prepreg, we carried out eight constant amplitude fatigue tests with four different displacement ratios, 0 0.1, 0 0.33, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. And for the wet layup, we carried out nine tests, but we had two displacement ratios, 0 0.1 and 0 0.48. It's preferable for each, each displacement ratio to carry out five tests in uh, for the prepreg, we carried out two tests at each one of them. And here we carried out five tests at 0 0.1 and four tests at 0 0.48. The frequency of um, the cycles was between four hertz and six hertz. And we were unable to go any higher. The machine, that, that was the capacity of the machine. Um, otherwise, it, it would start making terrible noises. And uh, the... the um, Standards recommend no more than 10 hertz so that you don't heat the specimen. And we wished to have a number of cycles of 3 million. And in many cases that we were able to do that. And that means that the tests were carried out continuously between seven and, and nine days, depending on the frequency. So then we would like to uh, plot the delamination propagation rate, the ADN, and it's a cycle number, A is the delamination length, and plot it versus various functions of the energy release rate, G, on log-log scale, thinking of Paris's relation. So one thing that's been done in the literature is people have used for this function G1 max, which is the mode one energy release rate at the maximum displacement. And another um, suggestion has been this delta G1 effective, which is the square root of G1 max minus the square root of G1 min. And this reminds us more of what has been done with metals because G depends on K, the stress intensity factor to the, the second power. And so in using the square root of G1 max, it's essentially using the square, the using K max or using something that is proportional to K max. So this has its advantage and we'll see that as we go. So instead of using G1 max, we normalize G1 max with, G, with G1R. So we have a G hat and we get G1R from our fracture toughness tests or delamination resistance tests, um, which I showed you earlier for quasi-static. Some people have normalized this with respect to G1C. Some people have normalized it with respect to G1SS. One person said that you should look for a G1 cyclic energy release rate. Well, I think that, that it's difficult to do, but it's, it's, good, it's a good idea to try it. But anyway, we use G1R. And if we, ca if we plot the ADN versus G1 max, then this is the kind of behavior we get for different R ratio. We get different thresholds, different threshold values, but we get a behavior that some people are um, unhappy with. 
because we get something that's counterintuitive. As R decreases, DADN increases, and we're used to thinking of it for metals in the opposite direction. But if you use K max, K1 max to plot metallic uh, properties, you get the same behavior. So it's just that it's counterintuitive, but it's not incorrect. But if we go to delta G1 effective, where we're using the hat quantities, and we um, plot schematically, we get the, direct, the right direction of behavior as R increases, the ABN increases for, for the given delta G1 effective. And we come to the same uh, threshold, which is an advantage for, for us. So now we'll just look at the prepreg. We don't have time to look at the, all, all of the data, but this is the data for the prepreg. And it's been plotted against G1 max, which is G1 max hat, which is G1 max to, to G1R. And if we think of a Paris relation with the D being log D being the intercept in this plot and M being the slope, we can see that for uh, RD equal to 0 0.1, that M is 6.8, which is very high. Because actually, if you think of metals and you used K, then you have to take this number and, and double it, which will give you a number over 13. Uh, and for metals, we see uh, the power and the power Paris law be something between uh, three, and, three and five for metals. So this is quite high, which means that propagation is quite fast, which is problematic. But let's leave that aside for a minute. If we look at the uh, next value of RD, we get M is equal to 8 and 8.9 and 23.0. And so here are all our different values of, of M. Now, if we plot DADN versus delta G1 effective hat, then we get the reverse behavior. Here we have RD is equal to 1. As 0.1, RD is 0 0.33, and so on. And if you would extend these, uh, these uh, the data, you would reach a G1 threshold. So here are the values of M versus RD for uh, G1 max hat. And this is the kind of behavior that schematically we are obtaining. And this is for delta G1 effective hat. And here are the a summary of the M values, which are quite high. And this is the behavior, if we would extend those curves, this is the behavior that we're obtaining. So this will allow us to find delta G1 effective threshold. And so we need two constants in addition to uh, M and D, the Paris constants, we need G1R and we need the threshold value, G1 effective threshold. So we are going to be able to find delta G1 effective threshold, it's a constant. And so let's, let me show you how we can manipulate the expression for delta G1 effective. That, that's the expression. We factor out G1 max, we note that RP is P min to P max. And so G min to G max behaves as the square of P min to P max. And that is RP squared. So we can rewrite the first expression as the last expression. And now we will substitute in the threshold values. And what we're interested in is we're interested in G1 thre threshold hat. So we can. Uh, isolate it is G1 threshold, G1 threshold hat. Uh, it's related to RP. So RP is given. It depends what we did in the test and this constant that we need to determine. So it's all up to determining this constant. So what we do is we plot delta G1 effective as a function of the cycle, number of cycles n. We extrapolate back and the, where they intersect is delta G1 effective threshold. And it's somewhere between 0 0.03 and 0 0.04. And when we'll use the Hartman-Skyver representation, 
will be able to iterate and determine a fixed value. So this is the hartman skiva representation that, that we have used. It's modified from what was done in metals and it's modified a bit from what some other people have done from composites. And we define it as delta K1 bar. And it's the difference between the square root of G1 max and G1 threshold. And what we like about it is we don't have G1 min. G1 min uh, is, is less accurate than G1 max. So I remind you that G1 max hat is the ratio of G1 max to G1 R. And um, G1 threshold is related to RP and delta G1 effective threshold. And this is the relationship. And so our two material parameters that we need are G1R, which we found from quasi-static tests, and G1 effective threshold, which gives us G1 threshold. Uh, and we know that it's between, it's in a, we, we defined it in a range. And so now we have to find it. And we use it as a fitting parameter. And we use it in a fitting parameter in this Paris relation, where now uh, the argument is delta K. So that was what I showed you previously. And by iterating, we find a specific number for delta G1 effective threshold at 0 0.0365. And now we obtain a master curve. This is the Paris relation with delta K one hat is our, or bar is, is our argument. And I remind you, the expression for delta K1 bar. And this is the square root of delta of G1 threshold. We know uh, the, the number that is delta G1 effective threshold for each RP. And we see that our data within SCADA has collapsed to a single curve. So we now have a single curve. And I will mention later, the importance of the single curve. But one of the things that we can notice is the slope is much uh, lower than for all of the other curves when we were looking at G1 max and delta G1 effective threshold. And so at first people said, ah, this is, this is a great advantage for um, damage tolerance. But we'll see later <laughs> that it doesn't, it doesn't really help. But anyway, we, get a, we do get a master curve and that's important. And for the wet layup, which I haven't showed you all the data, we get another, a different master curve, um, reminding you of all the parameters. And this is delta G1 effective threshold. And we have a slope of four, which is uh, even, even better. So if we compare our, our data, and this was the, purpose of the talk to make the comparison, we see that for a given value of delta K, the uh, wet layup, the propagation of the wet, wet layup is faster than that of the prepreg. So the prepreg has the edge on the wet layup for fatigue delamination propagation. And uh, the rest of the points here are the data from the tests. And so we have two master curves. And now we can back calculate, and now you can see the schematic curves. These are, the, this is the data, and these are the schematic curves leading to a, the, we're plotting with respect to G1 effective, leading to a threshold, a unified threshold value. And, we can take this threshold value for G1 effective that we obtain, and we can obtain G1 threshold. And we'll obtain, in fact, with units G1 threshold, not a normalized quantity, to see, to get a feel physically for what we're talking about. So we take G1R, which was 710.5, seven, we took it to 711, and we see for the different values of RP, we see what the threshold values are and they, they make sense. Okay, we also back calculated using G1 uh, max hat and we can see the data with respect to what we obtained from the theory from our um, master curves. 
And so using the master curve and the load ratio values, the fatigue curves may be back calculated for any value of RP. So if we look at this plot and we look at the load variations, taking our master curve, we can get any value. Uh, we can put any value of RP in our equation and we can back calculate the behavior, the fatigue behavior in any of these uh, load excursions. So just summarizing for our master curve, when we plotted with respect to G1 max, these were the values of M that we achieved. And they're, they're quite high. As I said, you've got to actually double them. So this brings us to make a comparison between, this is the master curve, th this is for the prepreg, and this is the curve when RP is equal to 0 0.75, that's when M is 20, 23. So at, at the bottom, we're plotting G1 max, and at the top, we're plotting delta K uh, bar. So we ask the question, what happens if we have a small error in, in the load? If we have a small error in the load, we get a small error in G1 max, but we get a large error in DADN. So it would seem that the master curve is going to be better. But the problem is if we have a small error in the load, we have a large error in delta K1 and you don't gain anything as far as slowing up the propagation by using the master curve. So you take a large excursion on DADN, you, you can't get, you, it's just a bluff to, to say you, you get um, slower propagation, you don't. So to summarize that, um, although the curve using delta K1 bar has a smaller slope than that using G1 max, an error or a change in the applied load results in a small change in G1 max, but a large change in delta K, and therefore a similar change in DADN for each case. So although we gained something that we unified uh, the behavior, uh, we didn't slow, we weren't able to slow up the delamination propagation. So in conclusion, tests were carried out on two carbon fiber material systems. The first was identified as a prepreg and the second as a wet layup. Nearly mode one, and why is it nearly mode one? Because, and I didn't mention this earlier, that we have an interface between plies with fibers in different directions or yarn in different direction. And so we have effectively uh, an interface crack between two anisotropic materials. So it's nearly mode one. We, we examined how much mode two and mode three we have, and we felt it was ne negligible. So we have nearly mode one quasi-static fracture toughness tests on DCB specimens for both material systems. And we determined a fatigue resistance curve. This gave us the G1R behavior. Initiation values for the prepreg were higher than that for the wet layup. And similar steady state values were found. Nearly mode one constant amplitude fatigue tests were conducted. For the prepreg, we had four cyclic ratios, 0 0.1, 0 0.33, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. For the wet layup, there were two different cyclic ratios, 0 0.1 and 0 0.48. A clear dependence of the delamination crop propagation rate on the displacement or load ratios, RP or RD or RP, was observed when the ADN was plotted versus G1 max or delta G1 effective. Two Paris type constants are needed to model the data for each value of RP, these being D and M in the equations we showed. We were able to get a master curve and we needed to have two more constants. One was G1R and the other was delta G1 effective threshold. The master curve allows calculation of DADN for all R ratios, and that's the big advantage of the master curve. Use of delta K1 
does not ameliorate the steep slope of the DADN curves. I still think that we have a big question how we can apply this knowledge to uh, damage tolerance uh, philosophy. The delamination propagation rate for the pre period was seen to be slower than that for the wet layer. And may I suggest to you a book which was published in 2018 on interface fracture and delaminations in composite materials. And I thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have.